I want to introduce our next panel, uh, which is brought to you by MFE Insurance Brokerage. Um, I'd like to welcome back on stage uh, Brad Rogers, CEO of Red, White, and Bloom, Peter Bersoom, CEO of 1906, Paul Peterson, CEO of Next Leaf Solutions, and our moderator, Vernon Davis, partner at Protus Global. The topic, navigating local cannabis brands. Let's give it up for these guys. I'm Vern Davis, I'm a partner at Protus Global, and I've been involved with brands for about 30 years, uh, over time building national brands, regional brands, uh, building local brands. I come out of the adult beverage industry years ago. And at Protus Global, what we do is we're a professional services business to the cannabis world, and we provide search uh, services and advisory services uh, to our clients. And uh, uh, we have some relationships that are here today, which are awesome. You know, you're investing in people and you're investing in brands, and that's how you execute the plan, right? Have great people, great brands, great companies. That creates great companies. Um, today, we're going to talk about branding, brands. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, obviously, how Michigan, which is a dynamic marketplace right now, fits into all of this. And again, um, introduce the panel uh, here. Uh, we have Peter Barson, CEO of 1906, which is a, a great business. He's going to get a chance to talk more about that. Uh, a lot about that. And uh, you just uh, saw Brad Rogers uh, uh, here at uh, Red, White, and Bloom. Uh, and he's going to continue that conversation with you today. Um, and, and obviously, you got Paul Peterson of uh, Nextly. And uh, uh, real excited to talk with Paul. He has a very interesting business and uh, maybe a little different than some of the businesses that we've been talking about. So I'm really excited about that. Um, that's great. So why don't uh, we start with you, uh, Peter, and just talk about 1906. Introduce the, the audience to 1906. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, 1906 is one of the leading cannabis edibles brands uh, located right now in Colorado and expanding out to Massachusetts, Michigan, Illinois, and Ohio. Mm -hmm. And what makes 1906 unique is the fact that we're focused squarely on uh, the consumer segment that we call high-functioning adults, people for whom cannabis could be a potential alternative to alcohol or pharmaceuticals. And <clears throat> we started the company with a first an, an insight of a problem. And let me start with a question. How many people here have ever had a bad experience with edibles or know somebody who's had a bad experience with edibles? Yeah, pretty much the, the pretty much the entire room. Um, and so our our thesis is that the most of the current edibles market doesn't really work for mainstream consumers, and that most of the market suffers from three major problems. Uh, number one is that products taste bad; they have a strong hashy flavor, poor quality ingredients. Number two is that you have no idea how it's going to make you feel. And our belief is that. Uh, people use cannabis not to get high, but in order to feel a particular way, that there's a specific functional benefit that they're looking for, whether it be relief from pain, help sleep, anxiety, uh, and that third, that there's a long delay between ingestion and activation time. And that those three factors, it tastes bad, I have no idea how it's gonna make me feel, I don't know when it's gonna hit me, how long it's gonna last, and when it stops, really creates a market that only serves people who either really need to or want to get very stoned. And for the rest of us who don't have six hours to have a date with an edible, the market doesn't work. <laughs> so, so we founded 1906 on that promise that for people like us in this room who are high functioning adults, we need products that taste good, that deliver a very specific effect. And I'm a New Yorker, uh, and my motto is impatience is a virtue, um, that are fast acting as well. So that's, uh, th that's the, the background and the story behind 1906. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, why don't we go over to Paul, since Brad has had 30 minutes earlier today. Not 
Yes, so our company, NextLeaf Solutions, is a technology company that has been focused over the last two and a half years of developing intellectual property around the extraction, purification, and formulation of cannabinoids. And our claim to fame recently became the first publicly traded company to have a, a multiple issued U.S. patents around extraction, purification on an industrial scale. Very proud of the fact that we've been able to beat in big alcohol, big pharma, and all the, you know, the uh, big business that's starting to come into Canada now, obviously due to our laws uh, and, and being federally legal for, for cannabis. And, uh, for us, we aren't building our own brands. We think that, uh, that intellectual property um, around taking biomass and putting it into a form that can then be standardized in, in the manufacturing process creates a lot of value for our downstream customers, and those are Mm -hmm. businesses that want to build brands and build distribution in, in whatever jurisdiction um, that they operate in. So that's really our focus is, is to empower uh, the CPG-based companies. Oh, that's great. That's great. And we're, we're going to ask, thank you for that, Paul, and we're going to ask uh, Brad to have a conversation with us about um, uh, Red, White, and Bloom uh, also. But Paul, I, I noticed something about Brad. He has hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wig. <laughs> I, didn't get to, I didn't get the memo. You're supposed yeah, to cut that off it. last night. Come on. He's uh, Brad's uh, bringing some diversity to the panel here. Looks like, so. Come on. <laughs> Go ahead, Brad. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, what was your question? I'm thinking about my hair now. How did you get your hair? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, look, I, I, I think, you know, as yeah. I said before, I think brand's going to be the game here. Um, for us, we're looking at that right now. We're licensing in some big brands right now. Yeah. Uh, one that I, I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, announce today, as a matter of fact, I think we can. Uh, we're signing on the dotted line very, very soon as, uh, as Cash Money Records. Um, so, you know, you look at uh, the history of yeah. Cash Money. It's the biggest independent record label out there. Um, they've run a really, really good business. Uh, they've started the careers of Drake, Nicki Minaj, uh, Little Wayne. Um, they're very, very uh, uh, in, in, in tight with those folks as well. If you look at the halo effect that you'll be able to get there, um, you look at uh, what that does to legitimize your product um, and, and what that means for a brand, I think uh, it speaks, speaks, speaks volumes. It's going to speak volumes when it hits the street as well. No, that's great. That's great. Why don't you go ahead and, and talk more about what you're doing and what Michigan means to you? In your business, Michigan, uh, Michigan was uh, was where we were born. Um, you know, when I was uh, in Canada, I saw the arbitrage in the United States, and uh, there was a little group down here uh, put a couple of stores together and saw this opportunity as as the regs were changing down here. Um, and and I the plan for, for for my company way back when was to was to delist from the TSX and come down into the CSE and uh, and, and and come into the United States and, and take uh, take Michigan as our as our toehold into the U.S. market and bring what we've done, IP and, and, right. and uh, standardization, and bring that into Michigan uh, and roll that across the United States. And so, um, you know, when we started here, we saw the framework in terms of how they were going to roll it out, you know, responsible release to market, uh, you know, and, and it was a very welcoming framework and something that we were very familiar with with respect to what was going on in Canada. Right. Uh, and, and although, you know, it's, it's a, it was a different market in that, you know, you could retail, you could have the full version vertical chain, it was, it's, 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 it's just an unbelievable market that you can take an advantage of. And so uh, we saw that as a, as a huge opportunity, came down here, built our business, um, you know, uh, we saw some, some opportunities of, of great retailers, people who are very loyal to brands that we've got uh, patronage uh, to, to some of the stores and some of the brands that we sell in those stores. And so we were able to glean a whole pile of information mm -hmm. from the Michigan market that we're taking now throughout the United States and identifying opportunities opportunities throughout that. So Michigan really is, uh, it's a phenomenal market, very different th from, from every other market that I've ever seen actually. Uh, it's almost, the, the familiarity of, of the patronage there is, is crazy. It's, a, it's, you know, people come in almost every day. It's like buying a coffee for them. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real transactional, real friendly environment. So, um, you know, it's really happy to see that model and sort of try and replicate that throughout America. I, th I think that's a great thing. Man, that's great. No, that's a good story and, and it's, it's good 
good to, to see the investments you guys are making mm -hmm. uh, in this state, in Michigan. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and you know, Kevin was talking about CSR as well, mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility. Uh, we're big on that. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're giving back right now. We're, we're doing uh, we're doing some some inner city things, mm -hmm. uh, building some uh, some basketball courts and uh, uh, donating some cities as well with respect to infrastructure. Uh, so we're very very happy to take part in that as well and give back. So that's okay. not just uh, one one aspect of no. our business. It's just not the retail. It's also giving back. That's great. That's 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 awesome. Um, you you have uh, some real interesting things going on in 1906, Peter. So uh, tell me about you know branding in a crowded marketplace and 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 what does branding mean to you and your business? Yeah. You know, fundamentally, we think about a brand nothing more than a promise. It's a promise to a consumer. What is this product going to do for me and, and why should I buy that product? And uh, a successful brand delivers on that promise. Well, it makes it clear what that promise is, delivers on the, and delivers on that promise. If you look at you know, classic brands, the promise of Nike is that you'll be a better athlete. Uh, even if you're not really an athlete, by using their products. The promise of 1906 is around that functionality, that cannabis can be safe, accessible, and that uh, you ought to have pleasure in your life. Our six experiences that we have kind of focus on the core things that people either use cannabis or other substances for. So we have a line for energy called Go. We have chill for relaxation and anxiety. Bliss for happiness, uh, Midnight for sleep, Genius, which is our latest product that's coming out uh, for cognitive focus, and then Love for uh, arousal and sexual health for both men and women. <clears throat> so it's very clear from both the naming and what the promise is of, of what that delivers. Um, and so it's more, we often think about brands as, okay, what's the label, what's the package? Uh, I really think of it as it's all of that uh, in terms of what the promise is that, that the consumer is. And then secondly, uh, as we've seen, there's also a often what consumers want is what's the mission of the company as well? Not just kind of the brand and the product, but what's the mission? And 1906 is the name that comes from the year that the Wiley Act was passed, which effectively started the era of prohibition of cannabis. And our mission is to bring cannabis back to its pre-prohibition status and highlight the failed century of the war on drugs, uh, particularly on communities that have been most negatively impacted. Um, so as, as Brad said, that social mission is a big part of who we are and what we do. Um, we've made a commitment that 10% of our net revenues go back to our communities in the form of 5% of our revenues go back in terms of research, and 5% go back uh, in terms of the communities that we operate in. And in particular, we're really proud of a program called uh, Grow Cannabis that we've developed, which stands for Generating Real Opportunities for Work in Cannabis. Um, much of the industry and press focuses on what the color or the diversity is of the license holders are. And while that's an important important element in what the composition of the industry is, there's an equally important element is what's the composition of the workforce as well. This industry will be creating tens of thousands of new jobs. And those who have been most affected by the war on drugs are those who have been formerly incarcerated individuals. And so we've committed uh, half a million dollars to start up a program that will actually provide two months of fully paid training for individuals who have been formerly incarcerated for drug offenses. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, uh, they'll be teamed up with Vangst, which is one of the large staffing agencies, in order to get jobs in the industry. And so that's one of the ways in which we're giving back to those people who've been most directly impacted by, uh, by the unfortunate uh, prohibition of, of cannabis over the last 100 plus years. No, that's great. I, that's much needed, and I, I think that is well directed. Paul, let's talk about, you know, uh, Peter really talked about the promise of the brand and, and the deliverable of the brand, and, and he, he takes us through uh, the mission of each one of his products here. How does your business uh, enhance that, affect that, and, and how, does, how do you define that marketing? Yeah, no, great question. Yeah. I think first and foremost, we always look at brands as more than just a label on the uh, 
the outside of the package, it's what's inside the package that, that really counts. And, and I think if you look at great brands, consumer brands, PepsiCo, Budweiser, they all have one thing in common. It doesn't matter what country you go to, what's in the package is, is, is standardized. It's the same in any jurisdiction, mm -hmm. right? They've got a formula and, and that formula is, is, is formulation is, is used when these products are manufactured. That's the challenge in cannabis. And the challenge is, especially when you're dealing with the herbal form, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost impossible to have a standardized experience for the consumer. For us, we're, we're only focused on manufacturing oil-based products. And for us, we're not focused on developing our own brand, so we take a little bit of a different approach in the sense that we really believe in, in, in partnerships and, and not trying to do it all. Uh, I think cannabis is a very unique industry in the sense that you hear a lot of talk around vertical integration. Mm -hmm. And you know, say this a lot, you know, PepsiCo doesn't grow its own sugar cane, doesn't, doesn't have its own stores. They do one thing and they do one thing better than anybody else and that's uh, branding and distribution of their formula. And, and so that's really our, our mandate as a, as a business is, is that we want to be the absolute best in, in developing and, and owning intellectual property that goes into uh, producing at scale uh, oil-based products that can then be manufactured into whatever formula uh, our clients want to take to market. And, and we really believe that we can empower uh, some of the great uh, CPG brands that will ultimately come into the cannabis industry, whether that's through CBD-based products or THC-based products. We think that, uh, you know, the other thing that people forget, and, and I think Canada is a great example of this, we legalized cannabis federally in 2013. And what we've seen in Canada, we've seen Altria, we've seen Constellation brands, we've seen Imperial Tobacco, you know, big tobacco, big alcohol coming into to Canada. And it's not that, you know, these companies really love Canada, it's that they love um, a, a, a federally legal jurisdiction. And you're gonna see exactly the same thing in the United States. And, um, we think that, that uh, when, when you legalize something federally, the biggest thing that you deal with then is FDA approval or federal approval. And, and I think uh, you know, that's something else that really goes into a brand. It, it's not just how you make it, it's not just the package, but it's, it's um, regulatory compliance. And, and I think that's gonna be the biggest um, disruptor in the United States uh, when uh, you know, the FDA rolls out regulations first, I guess, around CBD-based products, which are gonna be maybe 12 to 16 months out. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, when cannabis is legalized federally, you're gonna see a, a, a huge amount of pressure on, on brands to be able to manufacture their products in a way that are then standardized and can pass analytical testing. And so for us, um, we think that a great business is built on companies that focus on delivering their core competencies. And really, that's our, that's our mission is, is, to, uh, is to be the best at, uh, on the manufacturing side and then work with great partners that uh, then take those products to market under their own brands. No, that's great. Uh, that is critical to deliver on the mission yeah. uh, of the brand. Uh, Brand, what makes your business uh, stand out or be different than some of your your other MSO competitors? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think it is exactly what uh, what we're talking about standardization. Um, we, we we standardize cannabis in Canada. We had a label claim on every single product that went out the door. Um, that is your brand promise. That's uh, that's what you're going to be delivering um, consistently. And so when we license in our brands or build brands around those products, um, you're going to find consistency there. And so. Um, um, you know, to to <clears throat> to your point, you know, the, the old Joe Rogan uh, piece is uh, somebody gave me a bag of gummies the other day, and uh, and I and I said, so 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 what? How many do I take? And uh, and the guy said to Joe Rogan, he said, just the leg, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, it's like you don't know what you're gonna get, and, and so. <laughs> That's effectively uh, what we don't want. So we want to we want an experience that uh, you can con you can count on every single time. So you know it's like having a beer. You know what that's going to do to you. You know what two beers are going to do to you. You know what the Advil in the morning is going to do for you. You know um, stuff like that. So I, I just want to make sure that uh, that we deliver on that, and then we can build brands around that. So uh, when you when you look at that opportunity uh, to deliver consistency and quality, uh, time and again, and unfortunately it's a fragmented market. United States, you have to do it state by state, but we have that technology. We have the ability to do that because we don't have basement growers. We have PhDs, we have horticulturalists growing our product, we have actual scientists formulating our products uh, and doing the right things. But to expect 
Act that was federally regulated, which is incredibly arduous way back, uh, way, way north in Canada. <clears throat> uh, but we met those specs. And so those, those, those pharmacopoeia demands right now aren't here in America as we sit, but we're bringing them here. We're setting the bar. We're bringing those here. And we expect those to come, but we're going to be there when, when they show up. So that's effectively what we're going to be doing. And that's how we differentiate ourselves just from the outside. And then when you look at the brands that we're licensing in right now and bringing to, to market, um, these are billion dollar plus brands. Um, and it's very exciting for us to be able to represent those brands. And why are they coming to us? Because we can deliver that consistency and that brand promise and we can take care of those brands. Right. Well, that's great. That's, uh, that's all good news, it Brad. Is. That's all good news. That's great. So, Peter, talk to me about um, how you are uh, differentiating yourself because everyone's now focused on uh, dosage. Everyone's focused on effect, control, regulation. What makes your, your business different and what makes your business better? Yeah. First, let me take it. I don't think everybody's focused on dosage, and I don't think everybody's focused on effect. Yeah. You know, if you Fair. walk into a dispensary, mm -hmm. you have a dizzying array of choices that are there mm -hmm. that uh, have nothing that stands out about them. You know, typically in, in any given market where the potency cap is set, let's say at 10 milligrams, mm -hmm. you know, 80 plus percent of the products on the shelf are at 10 milligrams. So there's actually very little differentiation in today's m cannabis market. Let's just look at price as an example. The uh, uh, there's a strong convergence to the median in terms of pricing of cannabis products, right? From the lowest price to the highest price is a small is a small range. If we, if we take a look at you know just as an example, a pack of chocolates or a pack of gummies, it's probably not much more than a two x range. Mm -hmm. That is a smaller range than the pricing of bottled water. You can walk into a 7-Eleven and get a bottled water for 50 cents or get a bottled water for $3. That's a 6x variance. If you take a look mm. at vodka, you know, you can get a bottle of vodka for probably $10 or for north of $100. That's a 10x variance. And those are vodka and water are two relatively undifferentiated uh, products in the bottle as well. But when you look at cannabis, we have a very, very small range of pricing and a very small range of differentiation. And so that creates for the consumer sort of an inability to, to make good choices. Price is just but one measure by which consumers make choices. And one of the interesting things that we did a, a large scale survey last year uh, of dispensary shoppers. It mm -hmm. was the largest ever survey done of consumers who walk into a dispensary. <laughs> and one of the interesting things that we found there is that less than one third of consumers do any research before they walk into a dispensary. Mm. So 67% of people walk into a dispensary sort of totally blind about products, about dosage, about anything else like that. And what are they faced with? You know, they're immediately faced with a, with a bud tender who's generally male, who's generally young, generally paid anywhere from the neighborhood of $12 to $15 an, an, an hour there. And that person's supposed to help guide them about what their, you know, health decisions are. And so that creates, you know, that, I want to paint the sort of structural box there, which creates a challenge for anybody trying to build a brand and, and differentiate, uh, uh, differentiate there. Mm -hmm. So what are, we, you know, what are we doing about that? Well, one is very clear packaging. Second is earned media is our best vehicle for creating brand awareness. You know, um, when people are reading in the traditional media outlets that they look at, whether it be Vogue or Cosmo or Elle or you know, Fortune or Bloomberg or other or Goop, mm -hmm. you know, those are the mainstream consumer media press that 1906 has managed to garner a disproportionate amount of attention because that's where the consumers are reading. But um, that is one of, you know, people talk about what are, what are some of the challenges, and sure, regulatory is mm -hmm. a challenge, but I actually think that the, that the biggest challenge is navigating through all of the information sources that a typical consumer has, and how do you break through that clutter to give them information about what it is that they may be looking for 
for which they want to use cannabis for. Sure. So let, let's, that, that's good information. Let, let's talk about that experience of a consumer, because branding, you know, in, in your format and what you're doing is, is about the communication to me as a consumer. Right. That's what it's about. So I'm in the dispensary, okay, um, and you're at the mercy of maybe a poorly trained uh, dispensary employee or uh, maybe uh, a, a place that is not merchandised very well, Yep. right? So how do you affect that? How do you affect the ultimate communication with me? Yeah, so we try and do a couple things. You know, one is how do we get to you before you even walk into the dispensary yeah. so you have some awareness? Sure. Um, number two is in the dispensary, we have three strategies that we utilize. Number one is engaging the butt tender. And how do we turn those bud tenders into evangelists for our brand and our product? And that involves education, that involves uh, a lot of sampling, that involves swag, that involves uh, being present. And uh, we bring about 50 dispensary staff every single week into our facility uh, for tours of our facility so they can see where the products are made as well. And then the third thing that we do is we do pop-ups all the time. So on any given week, we do about, in the state of Colorado, we do about 30 retail pop-ups a week. So that's one of our brand ambassadors who's in the store, who's there to educate the consumers sure. before they even walk, before they even see the butt tender. Um, my point is that there's no easy solution. You, you gotta do a lot. Right. Um, because it is a very, uh, 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 it, it's very challenging as a consumer. When, when I remember the first time I walked into a dispensary, and it's like, I, I don't even know, you know, what to see, what to look at, how to make a decision. And I think the dispensary format, by and large, is pretty lousy um, in terms of as a customer experience, right? If you look at, it, you walk in, what's the first thing you have to do when you walk into a dispensary? You got to check your ID. Who likes to take their ID out, you know, to somebody? Because that's the first sign of rejection, right? I'm taking my ID out. What is the what is the risk that can happen there? Well, they're gonna they're gonna reject me, right? Um, there's no experience that I could think of where you take your ID out and it's a pleasant experience. You know, you 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 know whether going yeah. through TSA sure. or anything else like that. Sure. So that creates an unnerving kind of anxiety. Then the second thing you do is you're forced immediately to talk to somebody you don't know, like in that sort of pharmacy counter model. I don't know sure. who this person is. I may be having trouble sleeping. I may be having trouble with sex. I may be having a lot of anxiety, a lot of very personal issues. And here I am supposed to reveal to this total stranger who may or may not look anything at all like me, right? I've got to tell them some of my most, you know, challenging issues that I have for which I showed up here to have cannabis. Because by the time you got to the dispensary, you've gone through a whole host of other things that you've tried that probably haven't worked for you. Sure. And I've been suffering from insomnia for 15 years or so. And so that whole uh, 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 environment is nothing but anxiety causing. And so what do you want to do? You want to get the hell out of there as quickly as, as, as possible, typically, for a consumer. I think we probably all had those experiences, <laughs> man, I tell you. Um, Paul, I want to go back to you and, and, and have you uh, talk a little bit about your journey to how you got to Next, Next Leaf, right? How you got there and uh, creating the cannabis oils in Canada and that whole piece. Why don't you give us a, a quick story about that? Yeah, so I, I got involved in the industry. I guess in 2013, I was involved with, uh, I worked for the first uh, legal producer in Canada, called, a company called Peace Naturals, and we were acquired 2016 by uh, Kronos Group. And uh, I, I think from that experience, we were the first to get a, an extraction license and, and really seeing where things were going. Uh, when we left the company, we said, let's, let's start a company and only focus on um, extraction and manufacturing. Let's forget about cultivation. Let's forget about branding and retail. Let's, let's take, a, take a really narrow focus on this industry. And found some guys uh, that had been doing molecular distillation with cannabinoids. They were, they were clients of my fiance out in Vancouver. She's a, she's a cannabis lawyer. Um, and you know, these, are, these are guys like uh, you know, citizen scientists that were, uh, you know, in my opinion, back in 2016, years ahead of all these you know hundred million dollar uh, uh, cannabis companies and what they were doing on extraction and, and so we we filed um, 
24 patents around what, what these guys had, had been doing, and, and really that, that has been our focus is, is, is uh, the intellectual property side, which I think in Canada we have a huge advantage. Uh, while cannabis is federally legal in the United States, I think it's been, it's been challenging for entrepreneurs to, uh, to, to get uh, intellectual property uh, uh, granted, and, and so for us, we've been very aggressive on, on the, the IP front and, and the US patent filing front, and we think that you know, this, is a, this is sort of a land grab right now in the sense that because of cannabis prohibition for all these years, there's, there's so little prior, uh, as they, they call it prior art in, in cannabis terms, but again, the, the, the focus has really been on, on uh, the technology and then again, empowering brands uh, for, you know, through our downstream uh, customer base and, and really being that kind of manufacturing hub. Uh, for their products. No, that's great. That's a good story. I, I love that story. Now, as Brad promised you all uh, when he was up here talking about RWB, and that we'll have a chance to ask some questions. So we got a couple minutes. Great. You know, why don't we we ask some get some questions from the audience <laughs> to see if there's some things that you guys want to know that we didn't cover up here in the short 30 minutes that we uh, we were up here today. We'd we'd love to get your questions. Please. Okay. I'm a parole officer with the state of Michigan. I'm interested in your give back program in which you offer job opportunities for individuals who've been incarcerated. How can I follow up and get additional information regarding that? Yep, come up and see me and uh, happy to talk to you more about it in detail. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Where is it located? That's uh, Granville, Illinois. 3.6 million square feet. Um, we've got uh, it's 80 acres under glass, and uh, it's a phenomenal facility. It was uh, it's already been vendor vetted by Walmart, Target, Costco, uh, Kroger's, Walgreens, etc. So we have those vendor relationships as well right now. So that's going to be a great conversation to say this premium product is going into <coughs> your formulations. Um, Peter, you spoke about the experience that you don't want when you go into a dispensary, but are there any that are doing it right that serve as a model to aspire to? Yeah, I, I think I think there are some that that are evolved. I think we have what we're seeing is sort of um, two different markets. In the markets that were traditionally medical markets and dispensaries that converted from medical to adult use, I'd say those dispensaries have typically retained that kind of model that I uh, that, that I that I talk about. Um, what we're seeing is in newer markets that are opening up and, and newer dispensaries and also all of the new capital that's coming in, people are doing it a little bit more thoughtfully about what that customer journey is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because if you look at it prior to this, all you had to do was just have weed and you sold it and you made money, right? It wasn't, you didn't have to be very, you don't have to be very thoughtful or do much uh, at all. It's just, what do you have? Weed. Right. Okay, great. Uh, you know, here's your dime bag and, and, and walk out. As consumers have more choice, as consumers have more choices, and also as the demographic of the cannabis consumer is shifting to be more female and particularly also more senior, which is the 60 plus uh, segment is the fastest growing segment of cannabis consumers. Those consumers are going to demand more, mm -hmm. and there are going to be players, you know, like 1906, that will deliver a much better customer experience in that shopping experience, and it won't be as simple as, well, all I need to do is just have a license, have a storefront that says buy weed, and I'll be successful. So uh, I, th I think that we will be continuing to see more and more innovations in that customer experience. Um, but it's still a long way to go. That's good. More questions? This guy in the back. Good. Gentleman in the back. Hi, thanks a lot. Do you guys have any insight into what's going on with the world of display advertising online? The world of? You know, Google's made it real difficult for people. Oh, right. Yeah. Display advertising yeah. on cannabis. Well, I think my opinion is, 
you're going to continue to see issues with Google and, and Facebook and all these display ads online until cannabis is federally legal. And if you believe what I believe, I think we're 2025 in the United States until that happens. And I, I just think that's inevitable when you're in an industry that's federally illegal. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, these big companies are going to kind of follow what the federal government is, is, is saying and, and, and what's on the books. Good. Yeah, I think it's I think it's you know very difficult and very challenging uh, as a brand to create a digital a strong digital presence without the opportunity to do paid. So um, we're going to be trying something in the next couple of weeks uh, in terms of how to do paid advertising. If it works, you know we'll we'll blow it out. I don't want to kind of reveal the the secret. So uh, come on, tell us. Come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, <laughs> kind of tempted to, but kind of not so, because it could totally flop. So we're, we're gonna. I mean, I, I think it, you know there there are there are things to try, and it forces you to be innovative. And um, we're gonna try some stuff out using not 1906, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint. I mean, what is the number you know the number one or the number two things that people like on social media? It's pets. Mm. Um, so we're going to be trying a couple things with using okay. animals as spokespeople for our brand, uh, spokes dogs and, and, and spokes cats for our Interesting. brand as a way to do paid. So um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you know how that goes. That's fun. <laughs> that is fun. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to just offer a round of applause for yeah, how far you've absolutely. come. Absolutely. This is this is not an easy business for anybody, in particular for women of color, who uh, for which the number of dispensary owners and operators we can probably fit into on this stage across the country. So, um, you're raising an absolutely important point, and I think one of the biggest. Uh, problems that we have in the rollout of legalization of cannabis is that we haven't done more to not just you know award licenses but provide a far greater infrastructure mm -hmm. to support uh, women of color uh, and other small business owners in order to be able to stand up a legitimate business in this industry. We have licenses trading for 20 to 100 million dollars, a piece of paper, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is, you know, in, in my view, egregious, uh, and we're not reinvesting that back in order to support uh, business owners like yourself uh, to get your business up, up and running. So thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank Again, you. That was a, a great question and a great answer, Vern. I think we're going to uh, stop it here and get back on track, if you don't mind. So Aww. I really want to thank this panel. It was a fantastic one. We went a little bit over. Lots of great questions. Let's go ahead and welcome the next panel up, if you don't all right. mind. Thank you all. all. Right. That's great. That's a great question.